today's class, you are going to want to have a piece of paper and at least one writing instrument available, if not a couple different colors or a pen and a pencil, maybe a pen and a highlighter, just a couple of different things because we're going we're gonna to do a matrix today that is going to be almost identical to a matrix you're going to see on your exam that you're going to have to analyze. You'll see here in a minute what I'm talking about. But you're going to want to go through this with me and you're going to want to do it with me, not just like take a picture in the end. Um, I just think it's going to be really helpful. Uh, if, if, you're, if you are prepared to draw this matrix and go through it and uh, analyze it with me. So just a heads up, if you can round that stuff up, uh, that's in your best interest, okay? So I think we left off somewhere about here on Wednesday, um, where we were talking about the co different types of collusion that we might see with firms in an oligopoly market structure that two of the most common types of collusion, and remember collusion is illegal here in the US, but that it's done to kind of fulfill that number one incentive for firms and that's to increase profits. And then we talked a little bit about the ultimate form of collusion and that would be the cartel. I don't wanna say it's a market structure, but it's kind of a market structure. Like it's, it's really its own animal. It's, it's a market that basically is monopolized, but it just doesn't have one producer. It actually has many producers, but those producers are all controlled by one singular party. And so it's kind of its own animal. And we talked about how drug cartels are really the cartels that we see these days. They're the most successful cartels that we see. It's not that there aren't other ones and it's not that they don't exist in other parts of the world, but they must just not be that impactful on, on those of us here in the United States, like a drug cartel is. There are also really, there, there have been uh, recently oil cartel sort of activities, in nothing, not nearly as successful as drug cartels are, okay? And so this next slide, I'm actually, I wish I had taken it out just because it's so irrelevant. So we're not gonna spend any time on it, but it just basically shows you that a cartel acts as a monopolist. And so when we're analyzing a cartel, um, <coughs> when we analyze a cartel, we're not looking at all these different producers in some sort of market structure that's competitive, right? we would analyze a cartel like a monopolist as a monopoly market structure. So there's, there's nothing, nothing to see here, folks. Okay, let's just cruise right past it. Um, this is really a continuation of cartels. Cartels do what they do to maximize profit, right? They figure out the quantity that maximizes profit, just like a monopolist or any other firm would. Uh, a cartel is gonna figure out what quantity maximizes profit and then they're going to allocate that quantity and only that quantity among the different producers of the car cartel. Now, if you're a producer, a small producer in the cartel and the cartel tells you what your output is, it might be significantly lower than what you're already producing. And for whatever reason, it's what the cartel has allocated you. Well, now you have all this extra product, what are you gonna do with it? Right, and that's where cartels really are very difficult to manage. It's a, it's a, it's a nonstop maintenance if you're running a cartel. And we know that. We know that the drug cartel that was in Colombia, really, that's now in Mexico, the big drug cartels of the world, um, like you have to maintain that. It's a constant, constant process because it's so incredibly difficult to maintain. Um, and if you can't maintain it, it's just not profit maximizing. And so there are, there's a list, as you can see here, of the things that occur in cartels that make it really difficult to manage them or really difficult to maintain them. The first is differentiated product. Now, I don't have a lot of experience in this, folks, okay? I'm just like speaking on what I think I know. But if we're talking about drug cartels, we're talking about different producers in the drug cartel. 
I'm going to assume that those producers, those small producers that make up the cartel, perhaps are producing a slightly differentiated product. Maybe they think they're, they're, they're growing better stuff, right? And they might be, right? I don't know. But if you're, if you're producing a differentiated product, you probably feel like you should get a higher price for it. And that might drive you to sell outside the cartel, to cheat, if you will, on the cartel, okay? Not a safe thing to do, but a profit maximizing thing to do, right? Um, the other thing is different producers in the cartel could perhaps have different average costs. Depending on the size of your production, your capital expenditure, your transportation costs. I mean, those could vary greatly from producer to producer in the cartel structure, right? And if you're producing at a higher average cost, it means you're getting less profit than another producer in the cartel because you're all being paid the same price for your product, right? It's not being, usually being differentiated. Um, there are a lot of firms in a cartel, right? Um, it's hard to keep track, right? And there are low barriers to entry, which means that new producers theoretically could be joining the cartel at any given time. Okay, which then spreads that output, that production thinner and thinner among producers, which does not make producers very happy. Okay, and drives the incentive to cheat on your cartel. So all of these things sort of drive that last one, which is cheating on the cartel. And that's why it's so incredibly important for a cartel to manage its producers. And how do they manage them? Well, through usually threats and violence and things like that. Okay. All right, so let's switch gears a little bit. Um, let's talk about really one of the more informal forms of collusion that we see, and it's something we call price leadership. Under the oligopoly market structure, this is actually a pretty common thing, okay, is the oligopoly market structure. Um, oh, wait a minute. You guys can't see the slides. Can you? Yeah, we can see them. Yeah, the one that says price leadership. That's so weird. Okay. Um, I'm just seeing a blank screen. Okay, that's so weird. Okay. Can you see me? No. Um, okay. Yeah, that's going to be a problem. Okay, I'm just going to do it on a piece. I'm just going to do it on a piece of paper because I think I can show that to you real quick. Now you're seeing me, right? Yeah, we can see you. <laughs> okay, give me just a minute. I'm going to try. Okay, well now you can see me. So now I'll do it on the board. Okay. So price leadership is gonna happen and I'll just do this really quick and then we'll get back to the slides. Price leadership happens, you know, you have just a, a certain number of firms in the oligopoly market structure. And let's say you have four firms in your, in your structure. Um, and let's say you have maybe a larger, more established firm, okay? which typically becomes your price leader, okay? Now price leadership evolves through a pattern of sort of learned behavior over decades of operating in a market structure with the same other firms, okay? And price leadership just means that somewhere along the way, we unofficially designate one of the bigger, usually, more, um, more established firms in the market as the price leader. Now, this is very unofficial. This just happens over time. So it's not formal at all. It's not like you and I meeting in the back alley someplace saying, hey, let's fix the market or let's fix prices or divide the market or something. This just sort of happens. And price leadership happens. Um, uh, 
What have I done? Let me get back. Okay. Price leadership happens when we sort of designate a leader and then they more or less end up setting the price. What do I mean by setting the price? Well, they decide if prices need to increase or decrease on goods in that market. And when they make that decision and the other firms in the market see that, they typically um, follow suit. So they'll typically raise their prices or decrease their prices accordingly. Again, it's informal. It just happens. It's just reactionary behavior um, in a market that we drive by just getting to know the market, getting to understand the market, and understanding how to work together in the market, okay? Okay, um, what are some of the obstacles to price leadership? It's informal. Like we didn't actually sit down and decide we were gonna try and cheat the market to maximize profit. It just sort of happened naturally, right? Well, here's the thing, it really is illegal. Now, how do you prove that firms are engaging in price leadership behavior? Well, it's really hard, right? It's really hard. You'd have to watch a market. Someone from the government would have to just be watching a market and see a pattern of behavior emerge and then try and threaten the parties in that market in that oligopoly market structure with US antitrust laws, which is a set of laws that has been put in place really to regulate markets um, and promote competition and things like that, okay? Other obstacles to price leadership, why it might not work in an oligopoly, in a particular oligopoly would be uh, product differentiation. If I have a different product than you, just because you change your price doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to. If I feel like I have a better product, we're in a differentiated oligopoly and I feel like my product is better, right? I might not follow suit. I might feel like I can keep my price high. There is never any guarantee that others are going to follow you. Uh, it, it's just, it's, it's informal, right? Nobody's forced to do anything. And so let's say you are the price leader and you do increase your prices expecting the others to follow suit and they don't, right? You could lose a lot of business that way. So it's kind of a crapshoot, right? Um, barriers to entry, like you can't get, it's really difficult to get new followers. And so your followers are the ones that you currently have because we know there are these huge barriers to entry. Uh, and there would be incentives to cheat even a price leadership structure, which is informal, of course, but there would be an incentive for one of the smaller firms at some point to decide that when all the other firms in the market raise their price following the leader, that you might decrease your price, try and ramp up some business for yourself. So again, it's informal. There are definitely huge obstacles to it, but it does happen, okay? All right, now we're gonna switch gears a little bit. And we're gonna start talking about game theory. Game theory is the meat of this chapter. Monopolistic competition was like, yeah, whatever, right? It was this hybrid of market structures we'd already seen. It was graphs we'd already seen. There was really nothing new. And then we talked about oligopolies. We didn't really introduce you to any new graphs because they would kind of be the same as the graphs we saw under monopoly or monopolistic competition. This is, this is I think, the really new stuff in this chapter is this discussion about game theory. Game theory we use in a lot of different disciplines to really just talk about the interaction of, be, of, of parties, the behavior, sort of analyzing the behavior of multiple parties, how, how people, how organizations interact with one another. Again, you can, you can talk about game theory in a psychology class, you can talk about game theory in a lot of different classes. But in this class, we talk about it with regards to these tight market structures like oligopolies. Basically, game theory is about strategies. It's about decision making. It's about looking at what your opponent is doing and then deciding what you're going to do sort of as a strategic counter move to that. Basically, it is analyzing incentives. What are your incentives to cooperate with
with the other parties? What are your incentives to compete with the other parties? And when do you use each one of those? So I think it's interesting. And I think most of you are going to find this to be an interesting um, approach to economics. Remember, economics is a social science. It's about behavior, right? And usually we talk about the behavior of individuals. Well, here we're going to talk about for the behavior of firms, kind of opposing parties, if you will, okay? One of the most common and sort of most elementary things that we do when we introduce game theory in any discipline is talk about what we call the prisoner's dilemma. The prisoner's dilemma is this game, quote unquote, that shows sort of the scenario of two criminals who commit a crime together and are then separated, you know, are, are taken into custody and separated into two different interrogation rooms. And they have to make a choice, each one of them. They have to make a choice, are they gonna talk or are they gonna keep their mouth shut? Are they gonna confess to the crime or are they gonna, you know, plead innocent, play dumb? And there is a very specific reason why criminals get separated into different rooms after they get arrested together. And it's because the, the cops understand the incentives to compete and the consent incentives to collude and how that doesn't really work out when you separate two parties who then don't have any information about what the other party's doing. So when you separate two criminals, they actually don't know what's being said in the other room. And it's that thing that uncertainty that actually creates this prisoner's dilemma. So bear with me, I'll walk you through it here in a minute. It's a game that shows why players have difficulty cooperating, even though they would benefit from cooperating. If you put two criminals in the same room together and I can hear what the other person's saying and they can hear what I'm saying, chances are we're gonna cooperate. We're both gonna keep our mouth shut. The problem is when you separate us, I don't know if you're keeping your mouth shut or not. And you don't know if I'm keeping my mouth shut. And that creates that uncertainty, okay? Which changes our decisions. So strategy, just by you know definition, is what's your MO? What's, what's your operational plan? What, um, what are your objectives? What are you trying to do? Are you trying to maximize profit? Are you trying to minimize jail time? What are you trying to do, right? Okay. This is just some definition stuff to set you up for what you're about to see on the next slide. So a payoff matrix is just that, it's a matrix, right? It's, it's, a, it's a chart, if you will, with columns and rows and um, that has the payoffs for each party. Now, the thing about a payoff matrix is it, is it has combinations of payoffs in every square of the matrix because your decision-making impacts my decision-making. The decisions you make impact my payoffs. And because of that, right, we, we have to analyze each square based on the different possible, uh, different uh, combinations of outcomes based on the different decision-making by the different parties. So I'll show that to you here in a minute. Um, dominant strategy. Dominant strategy, again, I'll show you how this works in practical application, but a dominant strategy is basically a strategy that one party picks no matter what the other parties end up choosing as their decision. So it's basically you have the same outcome, you end up making the decision no matter what if you have a dominant strategy. So just bear with me. It'll all make more sense once we walk through it. Okay. All right. Here is your prisoner's dilemma payoff matrix. You can see it's just a regular matrix, right? And you have four squares, if you will. I know they're made up of two triangles, but you basically have four squares, four possible combinations of outcomes. Now, in the prisoner's dilemma payoff matrix, you're look, you're, you're as a prisoner, right? As a criminal you wanna look for low numbers because that's your number of years in jail, okay? So let me kind of walk you through this scenario. This is your author's example, Ben and Jerry, haha, ha, I didn't think of it, right? Ben and Jerry 
commit a crime together and get caught. I think they're burglarizing, right? A, a store and they get caught together and they get separated. Well, they're really, their only choice is to clam up or keep their mouth shut or confess. Okay, those are their two options. Well, they've been separated. And what you can see here is the combination of years in jail that each will spend depending on what they decide to do and what the, their opponent or the other criminal decides to do. So Ben's are these triangles in pink. Those are his part of the payoff matrix. And the blue squares are Jerry's part of the payoff matrix. So you can see that if Jerry and Ben both confess, they're each gonna end up with five years. If they both clam up, they're gonna end up at that bottom right hand square. It says one in one, they're both gonna get like a lesser trespassing charge or something like that. You can see that's where they're both best off, right? As a collective, they should both keep their mouth shut. Um, and then you can see that if Jerry doesn't say anything and Ben confesses, we end up at that top right-hand square where Ben is basically going to turn witness against Jerry and Ben's going to get zero uh, years of jail time and probation and Jerry's going to get 10. And then vice versa happens in the lower left-hand corner. If Ben says nothing, but Jerry actually confesses, then you can see that Jerry's not gonna get any jail time and Ben's gonna get the 10 years, okay? So when you analyze a payoff matrix, you sort of need to take on the persona of one of the parties at a time to go through this um, analyzing process, okay? So for example, I'm gonna pretend first that I'm Ben and I'm gonna say, if I'm Ben and Jerry confesses, what am I going to do? Well, my option is either to confess and get five years or to clam up and get 10. If I'm Ben and Jerry confesses, what am I going to want to do? I'm going to want to confess because my options are five years in jail or 10 years in jail if Jerry confesses. Five years if I confess, 10 if I clam up and don't say anything. Here's the problem. I don't actually know what Jerry's doing. So I'm running this in my head, the possibilities, and I actually don't know what Jerry's doing, okay? If I'm still Ben and I run the opposite scenario, I'm Ben and Jerry clams up and doesn't say anything, I can either confess and get zero or I can clam up and get one. Well, it sounds like if I'm Ben, I'm gonna confess either way, right? Because I am better off confessing because I don't know which one Jerry's gonna choose, right? And so Ben's dominant strategy is to confess. That, that's, that, that's why the strategy works. That's why splitting up criminals works. Right, because as they start to go through all of that in their head, and actually the cops are usually pretty direct, right? If you tell us what happened, blah, 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 right? Then there's something we can do for you. But if you don't tell us what happened and your buddy tells us what happened, right? He's gonna get off easy and you're gonna get all the time, whatever. He's gonna blame it all on you, whatever. Okay, so now if I run it, from Jerry's perspective, I'm Jerry and Ben confesses, what am I gonna wanna do? Well, that's a comparison between the five and the 10 along the top of the matrix. Well, I'm gonna wanna confess, right? Well, if I'm Jerry and Ben clams up, what am I gonna wanna do? Well, confess again. And so we probably will both end up confessing and getting up here in this highlighted yellow box of the matrix, we'll each get five years. Had we both kept our mouths shut, we could have both gotten one. But we, we don't know, right? We, we probably talked about it before we started committing crimes together, that if we ever got caught, like just keep your mouth shut. But once we're actually in that situation, and we don't have full information about what's going on, 
we do end up competing with each other and we end up in this type of situation. Okay. Any questions about that? Okay. Let's go through one more slide and then I'm going to do a matrix with you. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about a phenomenon called the Nash equilibrium. I don't know if any of you saw the movie uh, Beautiful Mind, but it was about this mathematician, Nash, this brilliant mathematician who basically spent his entire life doing math. Um, he's actually the one that introduced this concept to game theory. He worked a lot on game theory and the numbers, right? The numbers of game theory. So sort of tying behavior and numbers and things together is really phenomenal. But Basically, a Nash equilibrium happens when we reach a point on our matrix, uh, a, a, a point, a, a square, where it is such that moving away from that particular set of outcomes by either party wouldn't be beneficial. Neither party could do better off than how they are doing in that particular point in the matrix, okay? I know this seems like kind of obscure right now, but I'm gonna show it to you and it's gonna, it's gonna make sense, I promise, okay? If we go back up to the prisoner's dilemma, the Nash equilibrium is down there at one, one. Here's the problem. It's impossible to reach Nash equilibrium or almost impossible to reach Nash equilibrium unless you know what the other parties are doing, unless you have full information about what's happening. If these prisoners were sitting next to each other or these criminals were sitting next to each other, they would be able to reach their Nash. They would be able to both keep their mouth shut because they would know the other party is also keeping their mouth shut. They would be fully informed, okay? But in this case, we don't reach our Nash we reach, right, the opposite of our Nash. So Nash equilibrium, the player chooses the best strategy given the strategies chosen by others and cannot improve their outcome by moving away from that particular uh, square in the payoff matrix. So here's where you want your paper. It's right here. So I am going to Bring up, why is this happening? Okay, okay, I think I did it. All right. You should just see a blank white screen as your large screen. Is that correct? Yeah, that's all we see. Okay, awesome. Okay, so we're gonna start, this is going to be very similar to something you are gonna see on an exam. So if I were you, I'd write it out, I'd take some notes and I'd have it ready um, on exam day right next to you, okay? So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw my, a matrix. So what you wanna do, hopefully this will, I'm gonna start writing and see if it doesn't um, clear up. Okay, you wanna draw a four by four matrix. Okay, um, four by four. So here's how I'm gonna, do mine. Um, I'm going to make smaller squares along the top and bottom, and you'll see why here in a minute. And then sort of split the rest of it into your three additional squares of the matrix. Okay. These inner squares of the matrix need to hold more information, so that's why I made them a little bit bigger. Okay. All right. So in this case, we're gonna, we're gonna switch it back to an oligopoly market structure, okay? We're not gonna talk about prisoners, we're gonna talk about profit, okay? 
So my two opposing parties in this example are gonna be Coke and Pepsi, okay? Coke and Pepsi. And what I'm gonna fill in here in the matrix is, first I'm gonna fill in some numbers for Coke. Coke has three marketing strategies. Marketing strategies D, E, and F. Okay, I'm doing this in red. I'm not sure if it's coming through that way. Coke uh, and Pepsi has three marketing strategies, A, B, and C. And so Coke's outcome in terms of increased profits are going to change depending on which combination of strategies we're talking about. So Coke's numbers are going to be these first numbers. These are going to be increases in profit using these marketing strategies, okay? And then these second numbers are gonna belong to Pepsi. These are gonna be Pepsi's increases in profits based on the combination of marketing strategies. I'm gonna take a highlighter to this Pepsi stuff so you can see it a little bit better. Okay. So get that written down real quick and then we will um, go through the analysis like we did with Ben and Jerry. Okay, this is you will see a three by three. I know I told you to draw a four by four matrix, but this is really a three by three because the numbers are three by three, right? You will see a matrix of this size on your exam and you will have to go through the process we're about to go through and make the determinations we're about to make. And you definitely want to know how to do this because you won't be able to do it on the screen. You'll really, pro well, some of you will. You'll really probably need to jot it down real quick so that you can kind of mark it up. So understanding how to do that quickly is going to be to your benefit, right? All right. So the first thing I want to do is I want to take on the persona of one of our parties at a time. So I'm going to start by being Coke. So if I'm Coke and Pepsi implements strategy A, which strategy do I want to implement from my end? Not F, Dennis. Do I want to make 23 million in additional profit, 10 million in additional profit, or 15 million in additional profit? Thank you, Sean. Right, it's going to be D. It's going to be D. I'm going to go ahead and just Coke. I'm going to circle Coke's number right up here in, in D. So if Pepsi chooses A, Coke wants to make this $23 million in additional profit or whatever, right? Okay, I'm still Coke. If Pepsi chooses B, which marketing strategy do I want to employ? Yeah, I'm back up here at D again, am I not? Yeah, back up at D. Do I want 17 in additional profits? 17 million, 15 million, or 12 million? I want the 17, right? So if Pepsi implements B, I as Coke, I'm still gonna go with D. All right, I'm still Coke. If Pepsi chooses implements strategy C, which one, do I want to pick D again, right? Coke has a dominant strategy, has a dominant strategy. No matter what Pepsi does, Coke is implementing their marketing strategy D. That is a question I would ask on the exam. Go through and tell me if somebody has a dominant strategy and which strategy is dominant. Something like that, okay? All right, let's do it the other way now. 
now I'm Pepsi. If Coke chooses strategy D, which strategy am I going to choose in response? C, thank you. Okay, I'm still Pepsi. If I'm Pepsi and Coke chooses strategy E, which strategy am I going to choose? C again, right? Good. I'm still Pepsi. Coke chooses strategy F. Which strategy am I going to choose? B, thank you. Okay, does Pepsi have a dominant strategy? Thank you, Caitlin, the answer is no. Do they have a strategy that they pick more times than another strategy? Yeah, but that's not a dominant strategy and students get that confused a lot. So Coke has a dominant strategy, Pepsi has no dominant strategy. It's possible that neither of them do. It's just, it's just a, it's just a coincidence, right? It's just a coincidence. How does the numbers work out? Let's look at what is happening up here where we have circled both numbers. We actually have come to a Nash equilibrium. Some of you are like, wait, those aren't the highest numbers. Pepsi could have done better here and Coke could have done better here than what they are getting in what I am calling the Nash equilibrium. Well, yeah, except Pepsi actually can't have this 27. Why? Because the minute Pepsi chooses strategy B, we already know Coke is gonna choose strategy D as sort of their option, which means Pepsi can never have this. If Pepsi chooses B and Coke in return chooses D, we're gonna end up right here. Are they better off here than they were here? No, they're not, right? And the same goes for this one, right? If Coke is like, well, wait, we can make this 23 million over here Pepsi's gonna come in and say, uh, no, you can't, right? Because if you choose D, we're choosing C. And so this is a Nash equilibrium because neither party actually has any incentive to move away from here because it doesn't end up better for anyone to move away. And so that's the definition of a Nash, right? And so it is possible to have no Nash equilibrium. It is possible to have multiple Nash equilibriums. I'm not gonna play dirty and do two Nash equilibriums, okay? But it is possible that you will not have a square in the matrix in which you have circled two of the answers or they're both circled, right? So it would be possible on the exam to have no Nash equilibrium, or it would be possible to have one I will not do to. It's beyond the scope of this class. Okay? Any questions about this? You should be able to answer the question. Does Coke have a dominant strategy? If so, what is it? Does Pepsi have a dominant strategy? If so, what is it? Is there a Nash equilibrium? Where's the Nash equilibrium? If you can do that on this matrix, you're golden for the exam. I would take a picture of this if you did not write it down. Um, I will end up posting this lecture at some point next week. And so you can always come back to it and hear my explanation again if you need it. All right, I'm gonna, Switch back if nobody has any questions. All righty.
All right, let's go back and finish off the lecture. Okay, um, so now we're just gonna talk about some other like random game theory definition type stuff, okay? Um, nothing incredibly important, but uh, I usually have at least one exam question over sort of these other game theory definitions. So another important thing when we talk about those interactions that we have with, with other parties in the game theory context is whether is whether our um, whether our interaction with the other party is sort of a one-time deal or whether we interact with this party on a regular basis. And so we call that a one-shot game or repeated game. So a one-shot game would be like who's going to host or sponsor the 2021 Super Bowl halftime show. Like that happens one time, right? You you get one you get one opportunity to try and lock that down uh, amongst competitors, right? Or is it a repeated game? Do you have multiple interactions on a very regular basis with these other parties? And if you do, a lot of times patterns of behavior begin to emerge. Like we begin to get to know our competitor and you either cooperate or you don't cooperate with that competitor, okay? So it's, it's a decision that usually is, or a relationship that's usually established over time, okay? One of the strategies that we use to get our competitors to cooperate, even if they don't want to, is we use something called a tit for tat. Tit for tat strategy is one we use in repeated games. It obviously doesn't work in those uh, one-shot games because this is about patterns of behavior, okay, which happen over time. So the way that tit for tat works is you basically mimic your competitor's behavior from the previous round of game that you had. Now, my best example of this or what comes to mind, I have eight siblings and there was a lot of tit for tat, I gotta be honest. But when my brother walked up to me and punched me, right, I punched him back. It's like, you're not going to, I'm not going to let you think you can just keep doing that. I'm going to give it back to you the same way you gave it to me in hopes that at some point you'd rethink your strategy, right? It's that same thing. If you are giving back to your opponent the same thing they gave to you in the previous round, chances are at some point, they're, they're going to decide they don't want it back. And the cooperation is going to, you know, increase. And so, yeah, just a definition of a strategy that we would use in a repeated games, uh, a repeated games relationship. Okay. A coordination game. This is this is sort of thinking back to that prisoner's dilemma. We probably did see a coordination game there. It is a game in which, well, except for we didn't get to reach our nash, but had we been prisoners sort of sitting in the same room together, we would have seen a coordination game. It's a game in which a nash equilibrium occurs when each player chooses the same strategy. So if we were two opposing parties with full information, like I knew if you were talking or if you weren't, or if you were confessing or if you weren't, um, we, would, we would, as criminals, be able to sit in the same room and choose the same strategy, which was keeping our mouth shut and reach our Nash equilibrium, okay? We wouldn't do better than matching. Matching is, is our best approach in a coordination game. It, again, it's just a coincidence. It's just a, an occurrence, if you will. Um, so let's wrap up this chapter. So oligopolies, if they can uh, collude, which means that they go out of their way to do price fixing or price leadership or something like that, um, they end up with a higher price as a result. And that's the end game, right? To increase profits. And so they end up selling us less goods than we would want at a higher price. And that's what you get by colluding. Okay, if there are price wars, if 
which is the most common type of competition between oligopoly firms, then you and I at least could get a lower price, right? Um, so that would bring down the price. Either way, oligopolies are protected in the long run to some extent from firms entering the market. And so they're, because they're protected in the long run, they really are able to see higher profits just like a monopoly market structure. So monopolistic competition, remember we were able to uh, sort of make profit in the short run, but in the long run, because it was easy to come and go, we didn't really see profit. We got back down to normal profit. And oligopoly is gonna be a little different in the long run. In the short run, it's gonna look the same, but in the long run, they are able to see profits because they're insulated from competition because of all those reasons that we talked about, including economies of scale being probably the big one, okay? This last slide, this is just a wrap up of market structure. So this is our last market structure chapter. I would say we're done with the hard stuff or the hard S stuff in this class. Um, and this is just a nice table it sort of talks you through the four market structures that we touched on, um, gives you sort of a rundown. And I actually think there's something like this in one of your homework assignments for this weekend, uh, probably in this chapter, chapter 10, where you go through and, and you can do some comparisons over bar barriers to entry, differentiation, number of firms in the market, things like this. This is just sort of a nice Nice summary and nice wrap up of market structure attributes. Okay. All right. That's all I have. Please, please, please get started on homework. You should have two chapter homework assignments. And I believe you have a news analysis related to chapter nine. So three assignments total, if my memory serves me correctly. Okay, any questions? All right, guys, have a beautiful weekend. We'll do chapter 11 on Monday. We do all of a chapter 11 on Monday. So it's a pretty quick, pretty simple chapter. All right, have a great weekend. Take care, guys.